Uh, welcome to EL's second webinar. Uh, the topic today will be political Islam and radicalization in Austria. Uh, there have been a renewed series of Islamist terrorist attacks in Europe since late September. Most of them have been in France, but there was a major one in Austria, in Vienna, on November 2, by an Islamic State loyalist. Uh, the killer had recently arrived. Um, he seems to have found a lot of radical connections locally and also abroad in Germany. Um, the issues raised by this are many. Some of them are for uh, sociological, the ideological situation in Vienna itself. Um, migration policy, integration, and also just the uh, simple intelligence matter. The Austrian government itself has said it uh, somewhat made mistakes on this. So all of this and obviously much more will be discussed by our speakers here today. Uh, we have Dr. Elham Munir, who's an associate professor at Zurich University. She has long experience with Islamist movements and their ideology, their impact on women's rights and secularism and other issues. Uh, Dr. Lorenzo Vidino is the director of the program on extremism at Georgetown, excuse me, at George Washington University. Uh, his work on Islamist uh, movements in Europe is extensive, including on Austria specifically. Uh, we had a third speaker lined up, uh, Linda Schlegel, who is a PhD candidate at Goethe University uh, and who studies identitarian movements and extremism in Europe. Uh, we, she currently isn't with us, so we hope she will join us in time to give her presentation. Uh, if Elham, uh, you go first, and then uh, Lorenzo, and hopefully Linda, but we will have to play that one by ear. Uh, Elham, if you take 10 minutes. How about now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is because it was uh, okay. Um, I'll start by um, saying I um, I like first the manner by which you are dividing um, uh, or addressing this issue. On the one hand, you're talking about Islamism, political Islam, a political ideology uh, that uses religion for its own um, uh, um, political um, means and at the same time you're talking as well uh, about the far right um, and together when we talk about the two um, uh, forms of, uh, um, of movements we understand uh, that they in fact um, they seek confrontation, they seek division, they focus as well on identity. And identity is a very, very important when it concerns these movement. Um, when we talk about political Islam, as I don't think it's like I need to, uh, to tell my colleagues here, all of them are experts at the height of their um, uh, career. Um, on uh, Islamism, we are talking about a political ideology, but it is a political ideology uh, that uses uh, a certain uh, interpretation of Islam for its own political means. And it's very much uh, focus on um, the superiority uh, of the Islamic uh, identity. And it's very much systematic in the manner by which it addresses uh, its means. Um, we talk about local contacts, transnational contacts, and we talk about ideology. When we talk about local contacts, it doesn't make any difference um, uh, in which context we're talking about. If you look at the Middle Eastern um, uh, um, countries, how Islamists worked, uh, you see a systematic strategy to work together with governments. If they are not um, uh, able to do that, then they work uh, through other means. But the allying alliance with Middle Eastern governments has led um, to um, an inf infiltration of education uh, structures, uh, mosques, and at the same time, the media. Um, a similar strategy, albeit 
um, tailored uh, within the context of European countries depend on the type of state uh, uh, religious uh, relations. So uh, if you look, uh, for instance, in, in Austria, you see a state uh, society, a state religious um, relations that is based on acknowledging and recognizing certain religious organizations as more or less speakers of um, the Muslim uh, communities within uh, Austria. That has to do with the relationship between the Ottoman Empire and Austria, because really in 1912, but you have a new law that came about in 1915. And in 1950, with that law, um, there was a tendency to recognize um, um, certain organization. Of course, you have the Alaviyat uh, organization that was recognized, but you also have the Igigi U, um, the Islamic uh, uh, Glaubensgemeinschaft in Österreich. And this organization has certain affiliations, some um, certain uh, organization. Um, they have, uh, I will put it this way, they have strong relationship with uh, Turkish uh, government. And at the same time, some of their affiliates are also um, known to be uh, sympathetic uh, to political Islam. And the problem with that is that the type of state religion uh, relations reflect on how the state is um, working um, with these with its Muslim communities. So as a result of recognizing Igigu uh, as um, the main uh, religious um, organization representing Muslims, they have uh, control over the imams um, uh, uh, education. Um, they have as well um, the control over the education, um, uh, the religious education of Austrian Muslims. And that's very problematic because at the end of the day, um, the strategy that we see in different countries is that um, if you choose one organization that does not reflect the diversity within Muslim communities, um, and that organization um, may have affiliations with political Islam. Um, if you look at the religious structures, kindergarten, uh, religious schools, and I think Adnan Aslan, uh, Professor Adnan Aslan has uh, had a, a, a paper and a study that showed that some of these uh, structures uh, are very much programmatic in the manner by which they indoctrinate children into the worldviews of political Islam, that has an impact that reflect uh, on the long run on social cohesion. So this dimension is very problematic, I see, um, when it comes to this. We see, uh, notice here, I'm talking about political Islam. Um, uh, I didn't even talk about the jihadist uh, scene, but uh, it is, um, I know that uh, some of my colleagues may disagree with me, but um, uh, it is my opinion, and I think um, one can uh, disagree with that, is that uh, political Islam paves, uh, set the ground, the ideological ground, uh, upon which uh, jihadi movements um, uh, are built on. Uh, that brings me to the transnational nature uh, of jihadist scene when it comes also um, to the Austrian incident that you just mentioned. Uh, we, ha we, we, we know that um, um, the person who committed uh, this uh, crime um, had connections with two uh, Swiss um, uh, uh, in winter tour. Uh, we also know that there was a meeting also in Austria where these two persons attended in the Tawheed Mosque, um, the one that is right now closed uh, uh, as a reaction from the government, and that it wasn't only Swiss um, uh, uh, 
persons, you also had German and Kosovo uh, persons, young persons attending this meeting with this person who committed this crime in this mosque known for recruiting um, for jihadist um, uh, scene in, in general. So you have a local level, you have a transnational uh, level, and the local level, um, if you ignore, um, because it's, you see Igugu, um, they are basically um, saying that the actions of the government against political Islam um, are not exactly um, uh, helpful. They believe that these actions are stigmatizing the Muslims and they do not agree uh, on a definition of political Islam. Um, that is very problematic uh, because a Tawheed a mosque was also part um, uh, of its group of mosques. And at the same time, I do believe that Igigu has a responsibility in terms of standing up to these organizations or mosques that are um, uh, using um, a jihadist kind of um, terminology. It's just like you have hate kind of uh, uh, preaching taking place. Um, so um, um, I'm not really sure. Uh, I thought that this is a certain kind of input we can afterwards discuss. Um, but uh, in my opinion, uh, the ideology is core and the ideology um, is being disseminated systematically by political and religious structures. And if we look at um, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Milli Gürüş and others, it's a Turkish kind of counter uh, part to the Muslim Brotherhood. And they are also, they have a very strong presence when it comes to Austria. Uh, uh, to Austria, when we look at um, uh, their actions, one realizes they work exactly uh, on a similar vein as we see it in a Middle Eastern context, on a civil society, as civil society actors, as charity groups, and focusing very much on, chil uh, on children and youth in terms of education and programs. And that is problematic, uh, because we are not talking here uh, about a peaceful um, uh, ideology, we're talking about uh, an extremist, uh, religious, far-right ideology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lorenzo, if you take 10 minutes or so. Yeah, sure. Uh, good to be here. Thank you for, um, for hosting us today. Um, what well, I probably divide my my comments on the two topics that Alan touched upon, uh, sort of the jihadist component uh, and the political Islam component. Uh, and by doing that, I'm not making the strict distinction between the two because I do agree with Elan that the connections between the two are strong. And I think the Austrian case uh, shows that quite a bit. Um, a lot of people outside of Austria were a bit surprised that, that Austria was, was attacked. Uh, I think it, you know, this kind of this stereotypical image of the uh, beautiful, quiet, alpine country where everything works, which is true, beautiful country. But Austria has a long history of um, both jihadist and Islamist uh, presence. And again, with a lot of overlap between the two scenes. So let me start with the jihadist, the kind of how we got to this. Um, and then the, I'll address the Islamist uh, in the second part of my talk. Um, the scene in, in Austria starts in the 1980s, like pretty much uh, in most European countries. And it starts with a handful of very senior, very charismatic, uh, uh, mostly Egyptian, but not only um, jihadists who uh, receive asylum in, uh, in Vienna. And I think that's, uh, that's a common dynamic in most European countries. The fact that in both decades, uh, asylum was given to individuals who were key leaders of jihadist movements in the Arab world without much uh, thinking about what the impact of having these people live in, uh, in, in a European society would have been in the short, middle and long term. Uh, just a little side note, one of the, if we fast forward to of just a few years ago, the individual that really created the German speaking online scene 
uh, creating a bunch of platform which be became very influential, not just in Austria, but also in Switzerland and Germany, was a uh, name named Mohammed Mahmoud, who was the son of an Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood leader who received asylum in Vienna in the 80s. And then uh, he became more of a jihadist, became an ISIS supporter, set up his platforms, and then eventually moved to, uh, to Syria, joined ISIS, became sort of a mid-level leader within ISIS and, and, until eventually found his demise. Um, but that tells you a bit that there's a scene that dates back years. Again, a lot of people were surprised to, to find out that some 300 people left Austria to join ISIS and other groups in, uh, uh, in, in Syria and Iraq over the last few years. And it's a number that per capita is among the largest, the highest in, uh, uh, in Europe. And again, it's a product of a scene that has been quite active over the last few years. Uh, if the roots of that scene are to be found in those initial jihadists, mostly from the Arab world, uh, who came in the 80s and 90s, uh, also let's keep in mind that during the conflict in Bosnia in the 90s, which was really the first conflict that created a, a large, relatively large scale mobilization in Western Europe, Vienna was the gateway to go to fight to Bosnia. And generally the mosque that provided the documents and the logistical support for foreign fighters, at the time we didn't call them foreign fighters, but let's say for volunteers from all over the world that went to fight to Bosnia was the very same uh, mosque that has been under investigation now uh, for links to the, uh, to the attack. So the roots uh, have been there for a long time and the networks are very much the same. Now, over time, reflecting uh, what are the so demographic uh, dynamics in Austrian immigration, uh, the scene has become mostly populated by individuals from the Balkans, uh, from Bosnia, from Albania. So either Bosnians or ethnic Albanians, that means from Albania, North Macedonia, Kosovo, uh, and Chechens. Um, very large presence of both, both communities. Again, obviously a minority within those communities adopt uh, uh, the jihadist uh, um, interpretation. But uh, these are scenes that both in Vienna and in particular in Graz uh, have always been uh, very, very uh, active, very radical. In Graz, you do see a very large Salafist scene, some of it non-directly violent. But again, it doesn't surprise you that Graz has seen a massive mobilization of foreign fighters uh, coming from that non-violent, I'm using the teenager-like quotation uh, mark, um, then graduating into violence and leaving uh, uh, for Syria and Iraq. So that scene has been quite active. It is plugged in uh, internationally, uh, I would say mostly in two di directions. One is within the German speaking world and uh, Elam was um, referring to the arrests in Winterthur. There's been uh, uh, also inquiries in Germany uh, so it's part of, again, the scenes exist by language for the most part. Uh, so if you're from the German speaking part of Switzerland, you will look at Austria and Germany. If you're in the French speaking part of Switzerland, you look at France. So it really works by, by language for the most part. So uh, the, the perpetrator was part of this milieu of German speakers, uh, but there were also, of course, connections to the, to the Balkans. The ethnicity was uh, was Albania and that pipeline, I mean, we're talking about just a few hundred kilometers from Austria uh, to the deep Balkans and those networks do exist and are very, um, the interchange is very, uh, very live. I think in all this, the, the other element, which is undeniable is the fact that the, the Austrian state historically has not exactly been uh, the most efficient and the most aggressive when it comes to, to jihadists. Uh, it was not in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s when nobody except the French uh, really uh, were aggressive. Uh, so they gave political asylum left and right. But even over the last few years, uh, when most other European countries have somehow somewhat uh, tightened uh, things and passed new laws, uh, the Austrians are still a system that is fairly light. It's fairly light when it comes to manpower, uh, the security services, uh, the police uh, do not exactly have the, uh, 
large scale effectives that one would probably think is needed to, to confront the challenge. And the legal tools are fairly light. I think one thing that struck a lot of people was the fact that the attacker received a 22 month sentence for trying to join ISIS. And again, I, of course, the details will be, you know, I'm a bit hesitant to get into the details, but for what, until they are really cleared by, by a serious government, governmental inquiry, but it seems that some judge thought that even 22 months was too long of a sentence and decided to cut it short. And uh, that's, that's pretty telling and I think quite, um, quite problematic. Uh, so uh, it, it's a system that despite some changes over the last few years, needs to be fine-tuned and it's obvious that uh, among the the many things that Chancellor Kurz announced uh, late last week uh, a lot of the, the 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 changes that he announced he proposed of course everything will have to go through through parliament uh, have to do with tightening the system uh, and changing a lot of things uh, on the jihadist side now where Austria has been very very <laughs> aggressive on the other hand, over the last few years, has been on the political Islam side of things. Uh, it means in challenging it. Now, when it comes to the presence of the allegedly, again, non-violent side of things, so Muslim Brotherhood networks and so on, Austria has always been, a, again, a fairly disproportionately high uh, presence of network. I'm uh, reminded of uh, how the Egyptian media in 2000, uh, um, 14 announced that the Brotherhood had moved its head, headquarters to Graz. And I, I no disrespect to the Egyptian media, but sometimes it seems to it exaggerates things a bit when it comes to the Brotherhood and there's a bit of hysteria. Uh, but like beyond every conspiracy theory and rumor, there's always a little grain of truth. Uh, and that is the fact that in Graz and in Vienna, there's historically been a very large presence of the Muslim Brotherhood, very uh, high ranking individuals have lived there, have operated there. It goes back to Yusuf Nada in the 1960s, uh, individuals like Ayman Ali, who uh, became the head of sort of the main front for the Muslim Brotherhood in Austria, staunchly denied for years being a member of the Brotherhood, even sued a major newspaper in Austria who dared say that he was Brotherhood and that a couple of weeks after Mohamed Mursi was elected president, of course, flew to Cairo to become one of his top advisors. Uh, and that tells you a bit about how relatively large and sophisticated the Brotherhood Network in Austria uh, has been. It has two main components. One is the Egyptian one and the other one is Syrian, uh, split for the most part between uh, Vienna and, uh, and Graz. There's also a Palestinian component, which is fairly large. And of course, what we have seen, again, reflecting trends we see throughout Europe uh, over the last few years, a very strong support from Turkish government uh, networks uh, over the last few years. That means political support, it means manpower support, it means financial support, uh, and a symbiosis between these networks uh, that is evident and is very much of concern uh, to the Austrian government. Uh, and so what we have seen over the last four or five years um, is a very concerted effort by the Austrian government, which of course sees uh, now Chancellor Kurz as the main driver, but I would say that it has a fairly broad and bipartisan support within the Austrian political spectrum. Socialist party may not be fully on board, but you know, I've I've seen depictions, particularly in the uh, English language media, of Kurz's uh, government as a ultra right wing government, and forgetting that the coalition partner of Kurz is the Green Party, so not exactly a neo fascist party, um, and and they've been supporting his his actions. And what are the actions they have taken? Well, uh, it starts a few years ago with banning foreign funding with putting stringent requirements for imams and trying to really uh, separate uh, Austrian Islam for uh, malign uh, foreign uh, influences. We've seen over the last few years several mosques being shut down, most of them linked to Turkish networks. Uh, quite a bit of pressure on uh, 
different Islamist groups, but also on what the Austrians and the Germans rightly consider right-wing groups, which are the Grey Wolves, uh, which despite not being the per, per se Islamist, uh, act very much as muscle at times for sort of the uh, Turkish Islamist, uh, Islamist networks. So uh, all these things have been very much agenda priorities for, for the Kurds government over the last few, year, uh, last few years. Now, of course, after the attack in Vienna, there's been uh, uh, more um, ideas being brought forward. Uh, these are not new ideas. This is something that uh, the Kurds government has been discussing internally and to some degree externally for years. Uh, but of course, there's an impetus now. And completely uh, separate to that, and then I'm going to close it there, there's this very large investigation uh, that originates in Graz, uh, which is really unrelated to what happened in Vienna to the terrorist attack, uh, but it went to target some 60 individuals, pretty much the who's who of the Brotherhood in, uh, in Austria, uh, their institutions, and, and the charges are very severe. We're talking about terrorism links, we're talking about financial charges, uh, and this is really something that I have to say unprecedented in a Western uh, context, uh, where the uh, if we have seen, of course, investigations against Brotherhood networks in the past, uh, even some large scale ones. I'm thinking of the Holy Land Foundation case in the U.S. Uh, uh, it was always against one individual, a few individuals, one entity. Here, the idea is to investigate the whole network, the whole presence of the Brotherhood in the country, which is seen as uh, terrorism linked and subversive. And, and this is something that the Austrians have been saying for, for a long time. Um, I use in my, in my book uh, a quote that comes from, uh, um, from a case in an administrative court in, in Vienna, uh, sorry, sorry, in Graz, in which uh, the court has to decide on the asylum application of the wife of Ayman Ali, the Mursi advisor I discussed earlier. And there's an opinion from the Verfassungsschutz, from the security services of Austria, uh, that argue that asylum cannot be given uh, to Mrs. Ali uh, because the Brotherhood is an organization that is subversive and whose values are in direct contraposition with the uh, values of the Austrian constitution. So when that is the starting point of how the Brotherhood is assessed, you can see why we're, start, we're starting to see these investigations from a judicial point of view and the political pressure that is going to be put by, by the Kurds government. Uh, how that is going to develop, that's probably a good, good question to be asked uh, uh, later. I can wrap it up a bit. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we're going to move into questions. So people can, there's a raise hand feature which is at the bottom of your screen and if you do that I can see you and then I can uh, unmute you and we can ask questions that way. If you don't want to appear on screen you can write the questions in and I'll ask them, uh, I'll ask them directly. Uh, I'm going to abuse my moderator's position to ask the first question uh, which is uh, as I'm sure you know after these attacks especially in France um, the there's been a lot of terrorism and uh, particularly the the laïcité idea. Uh, in Austria, as was mentioned uh, by Elham earlier, there's a different setup, which is that certain organizations are recognized as kind of the official spokesman for, for Islam in the country. Uh, if you were going to do something as the Austrians seem to be, they're going to try to crack down on political Islamist groups and uh, other just kind of subversive or terrorist linked networks, will they have to change in any sense that's so a two-part question. A two-part question is: What will they have to change their formal stance on secularism in some way? Um, and as a second part of that, uh, do, do you uh, just the broader question of like laicite? Do you buy the idea that it's a, it's some part of the uh, the radicalization process, as some people have suggested? So, if I, a slightly unruly question, but if I give that to you, uh, I'll hand first. Yeah, thank you. And so actually, I think it's a very important question. Now, here's the thing. Um, France has um, this very strict uh, separation between state and religion. Austria doesn't have it in that way. It has a different uh, state religion 
um, setting. And yet both of them are having problems. Okay, both of them are having problems with political Islam and um, Salafism. As I said, uh, you know, if you read, um, I have the book in German. It's coming in English. Uh, the perils of political uh, of um, of nonviolent Islamism. Um, I uh, distinguish between uh, um, societal Islamism. These are new fundamentalist religious movement, including Salafism, but uh, Diobandi. Uh, and then you have on the other uh, side, political Islamism, which include Muslim Brotherhood, Milli Gurush, and you just name it. That said, um, in France, um, the problem has to do with the absent of the state in areas that were filled, the vacuum that was left was filled by the structures of societal Islamism, and also Muslim Brotherhood and other organizations. Um, and here again, as uh, uh, Lorenzo really um, um, beautifully uh, uh, explained to us that it basically uh, also the French kind of like connection, the language you also see if Morocco, the Moroccan uh, Muslim Brotherhood, you see them also working in area in France. Um, when it comes to the Austrian context um, specifically, I would in fact uh, argue for a new setting. One, uh, you can't change the whole structure because if you do, you will have also to, uh, to ask the question about the, 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 the Catholic church. And the Catholic church in Austria is very strong and it won't be very happy about any kind of um, um, restrictions uh, on its state uh, um, uh, church relations. What I would suggest is basically that when it concerns um, the imam education, when it concerns um, the curriculums for religious teaching for children, these two dimensions should be professionalized. And that means it has to be done within university setting. And when they do that within university settings, they have to do it in a manner that really reflects the diversity within the, 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 the Islamic faith. Um, and at the same time, um, the religious communities have, have to employ the imams um, in their own uh, mosques. And that means um, we cannot accept a situation like we see right now in Germany, where, where you have this main organization, religious Muslim religious organization saying, we will not take um, any of these imams that you are producing. They do not uh, fulfill our standards. And that means we need a kind of certification for imams. All I'm trying to say, there's um, a strategy by Islamists and they work on the imams, they work on the education of children. These tools that actually help disseminate their ideology should be taken away from them. And I'm here just saying, regardless of which organization we're talking, the state is working with, it is very important that these issues should be professionalized. We have a certain setting here in Switzerland where that professionalization has been taking place in other uh, religions, specifically the church, but um, we don't have that when it concerns the Muslim communities. And I think this, is, this idea should be really implemented on a European uh, level in general. And, uh, at the same time, uh, why would you choose one con uh, organization? Because it's not about recognition of Islam. Islam is a, a great uh, civilizational um, religion. Um, it doesn't need recognition. What, what they are trying is uh, through this tool is to regulate the relationship between the state and this religious communities. But if you look closer, one should also ask the question, do these organizations really reflect, um, uh, represent the majority of Muslims? And wouldn't it be better if we start to look at these Muslims as Austrians, citizens, and have a direct relationship with them 
And when it comes to a religious, uh, um, uh, how should I say, when one wants to exercise uh, his or her faith, then we do it in a manner um, that are uh, professionalized and in the manner that I basically mentioned. Does it make sense what I said? It does. Thank you very much. <laughs> if we go to Lorenzo for the same question, hopefully you can still remember it. No, I, I think Elama addressed it in a way, I mean, it's such an elegant way, but I cannot add much. Uh, don't disagree with anything. I think the challenge, if I can just add one thing, is, of course, in finding an alternative. So let's say hypothetically, 100% hypothetically, that the um, Austrians, whether through a judicial investigation or whether through a political process, take out the management of Islam from those entities, most of which are within the Islamist space, but have managed it, management for decades now in Austria. What next? Who does it? And I think that's the challenge that everybody will, will have. I think in a way on this, my sense is that the French are slightly ahead compared to the, to the Austrians in preparing an alternative, in fostering an alternative because you know, nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, you're gonna have, you're gonna need to have some people who will be uh, managing certain aspects of Islam. It, it is obvious, it's obvious to everybody that these entities, uh, I'm talking about Islamist ones, uh, if they are challenged, if some of their uh, reins of power, which are generally their administration of certain aspects of Islam, uh, are taken away from them, are going to use the, this is a war against Islam, it's Islamophobia, this is not against us, it's against Islam and Muslims in, uh, in France, in Austria, in Europe, uh, and so on. That argument will have much more credence with the majority of the Muslim population uh, if there is no other entity to which the government can say, say, look, we work with these entities, which are more credible, which have uh, much more are much more representative because they have been elected, because they respond to certain professional criteria, uh, and there are standards for who they are. But my concern is that I, I completely support the idea of not leaving the monopoly of everything that has to do with Islam in Austria, or management of Islam in Austria, to entities that are part of the Islamist galaxy. But once they, um, they no longer have it, somebody has to be there. There needs to be an interlocutor. It is true, as El Ham was saying, that Islam doesn't need recognition. Uh, it's, Islam will survive without the Austrian state recognizing it, of course, but there need to be people that appoint imams, uh, the people who run mosques and uh, uh, receive the funding that the Austrian state gives. Uh, and I'm not sure that, that it's, it's there. Um, you know, the Brits uh, uh, sort of did more timidly what the Austrians are doing now some 10 years ago and history repeats itself. Uh, uh, by the end of the Tony Blair government, uh, Labour and definitely then uh, the Conservatives with Cameron, so end of uh, the 2000, beginning of the 2010 decade, decided that the sort of self-appointed representatives of the Muslim community, the MCB, uh, MAB, all these entities were A, not representative, B, not moderate, uh, so they, no longer needed to be the ones, the one, uh, the only interlocutors of the British state, and that ranged from meeting in down uh, in Downing Street to organizing the Eid celebrations in every town in, in the UK. So policy was we no longer work with these entities. Okay, so who do you work with? Who are you going to give the uh, the contract to organize the Eid celebration at the end of Ramadan in your city? Somebody has to do it. And the problem that the Brits faced was not really having any entity that had an even remotely comparable uh, degree of sophistication and organization to act as a bureaucracy and interact with the British bureaucracy. 
uh, Boris Johnson was mayor of London at the time. And once he was basically told, we no longer give some entities the facilities and the money to organize Eid, so okay, who do we give it to? Who, who, who's my partner? And I think that's the next challenge. Once we, and I do see major changes, not just in France and Austria, but generally throughout continental Europe in terms of mindset and understanding that Islamists are a problem and at least should not be supported. But then the next step is, okay, so how do we create an alternative? Now, if I, if, if I may, Lorenzo here, the problem is uh, the moment you uh, create a parallel um, Muslim structure, it will lose its uh, credibility uh, by the majority. And, and for me, the question is basically, um, we are live in a free society and civil society actors and organization should work. What I want to see, and that's the word that I use, a professionalization of imam education and of the production of religious curriculums for children, Muslim children and um, uh, uh, youth. And of course, the religious teachers that are teaching uh, Muslims about Islam. Uh, these are the three key aspects within uh, um, with which um, Islamists uh, disseminate their own ideology. And with that, what we need uh, actually are um, uh, structures um, that are built on a professional manner. Um, we, we are, there are ideas I, I hear there was an idea, but it's not, unfortunately, um, no one seemed to be interested in it. It's that do you, within universities, um, you have, for instance, at the at Österreich, uh, at the University of Vienna, you have Adnan Aslan, and you have this wonderful institute. But it's just basically, it has to be more professionalized with diverse kind of like uh, academic input, but uh, they're not going to produce an academic version of Islam. What they are going to do is a professional uh, manner by which you educate and train imams and teach children. And away from this worldview of Islamism, away from the separatism of the social, societal Islamism. Uh, and, and that's what I'm trying basically to say. Um, on the one hand, I understand what you're saying, but on the other hand, um, think about also the legitimacy in the eyes of those people, um, Muslim communities, um, whether that will be representative also from the eyes. They will say this is the, the state's uh, organization, as they do right now in, in, in Middle Eastern countries, where they say this institution is basically representative of the um, uh, Islamic dawla, uh, the, the, the state's Islam. I don't know. What, what do you think? As a second, I really, um, and I mean it here, it's just, uh, I know we are in a webinar, but I'm really interested in your opinion as an expert on this. What do you think about this idea of professionalization of uh, Imam Ausbildung? Uh, yeah, but I think it, 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 it necessarily has to come with state support. I don't see an alternative. Listen, in an ideal world, this would be funded by civil society, people within the Muslim no, community. No, 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 no. If the state has to be involved here. When okay. it comes to this, the state has to be involved. Uh, so this, we're in agreement. You know, um, but because it's important. This is uh, it's not something that we can ignore and say, hey, this is an interference in religious affairs. No, it's not. We have a problem when it comes uh, to, uh, uh, to my faith. We have a problem and we have to acknowledge it. Yeah, I mean, listen, in an ideal and to some degree in the US, there is a dynamic of philanthropy, which is very different from Europe in which we're starting to see some um, individual of a Muslim background, Americans uh, that are funding imams, schools that provide uh, American interpretation of Islam and imams that, that are 
obviously educated in uh, in Islam, but also mindful of the setting and aware of American society and, and so on and so forth. And it's mostly done, I mean, it's 100% done by American philanthropy, by successful Muslim individuals and families who fund that. And I do really like that model, I think, where you don't have state interference, because anytime you have state interference, it creates that, that, uh, that stigma that you described. I do not think that's really possible in Europe. I don't, don't see it. I think it's very, uh, it's not really realistic to, to, to think that. And the state has to intervene. Uh, the million dollar question to which I, I think it's very difficult to answer is how to avoid the stigma. If the pro professionalization comes only from uh, um, some kind of state certification, state is funding, state intervention. How is the mom that graduates? And I know that in certain countries like Germany, this has been going on for years, uh, Belgium. Uh, how is the mom that is certified by certain bodies welcome in the community? Do they get jobs? Do they uh, go to this, you know, yep. are, is it a successful degree or not? And that's the problem is basically when you look at in Germany uh, and, and that's what I actually meant by it has to be mandatory. Those imams who are being trained and have the certificate are the one that should be appointed in mosques. And if these uh, organization, because um, you have several organization, whether in, in Austria or in Germany, they, re they uh, reject certified um, uh, imams, they rejected. And we know that, that this was the case in, uh, in, in Germany um, lately, that was actually discussed last week or uh, two weeks ago. When they reject that, then it has to be, it come with a, a clear message from the state side. I'm sorry, here it's, they have to be um, certified according to these standards according to the from these institution that we are offering you understand i don't think we we we, we disagree it just basically i don't want it to be muslim kind of um, um <laughs> alternatives no we don't I, disagree mm -hmm. i don't think we disagree a lot here mm -hmm. reconcilable um uh, we are approaching the end. So I'm basically um, gonna ask one final question and if you can wrap it in with a closing statement, then uh, I think we can call it a morning. Uh, the one I was gonna ask was, uh, Lorenzo mentioned that the Austrian state takes a very, how should we say, non-harsh approach with um, its security apparatus. Uh, and I, this is in the area of work I do, it's notorious for espionage that Vienna is a, a pretty much a playground for spies and things that they just the Austrians don't tend to uh, intervene that much um, is there a way to reform that or is it just simply would it more to the point what I mean is what are the blockages to that or, or are they removable uh, are they cultural are they legal are they political how would we get past that uh, and is it is there even a, an important way to go or is it if you solve these kind of state societal issues would the security issue fade away and be insignificant? So again, sorry for a slightly um, wordy question, but if we hand over, uh, if we go first to Lorenzo and then finish with uh, Elham to yeah. do it in the reverse order how we started. Uh, it is happening. No, it's absolutely. Mo most of uh, these problems are removable and, and this is happening. It, it's, uh, it's a conversation that has been going on for the last few years in Austria. Uh, but I think here you have, uh, to some degree, the perfect combination because you have, um, it's cynical to put it like that, but a terrorist attack, which the experience of all other European countries have shown us that it unfortunately takes uh, an incident to motivate policymakers to improve certain parts of the, uh, the security apparatus, the laws, uh, giving more funding to, to, to counter terrorism. And the reality is that naively most countries, until they're hit, they don't really think that they, they need to do this kind, of, uh, this kind of things. And together with the fact that you have a government that uh, has 
definitely taken a strong position uh, on these matters um, without really much of an opposition saying uh, the opposite. So I, I think when you have all these elements together, uh, I think we do we, we are likely to see change. Head of the Verfassungsschutz was removed, uh, uh, stepped down last week. Um, their courts introduced uh, uh, a very broad set of, in, of initiatives in a bill last week. Everybody was uh, commenting on the fact that they introduced the crime of political Islam. It's not really exactly what it did, but if you read the proposal, which is available online uh, in German, uh, you, you'll see that there's the majority of the around 50 um, ideas are uh, really about strict security, uh, improving certain aspects. Uh, and, and the other thing is the cultural aspect. You're right in pointing out to a certain uh, lax approach. Uh, um, I'm getting a sense of this is uh, this is to some degree changing. Having said that, a lot of the the the, the faux pas that we saw in Vienna are things we've seen everywhere the fa uh, throughout Europe over the last few years. The fact that the attacker was known, the fact that uh, the authorities missed uh, certain clues. We've seen it in countries that have a much better counterterrorism apparatus, like France, the UK, uh, everybody's made mistakes. If we think of the attacks in France and the UK we've seen over the last few years, there's always mind blowing mistakes by, uh, by authorities. Mm -hmm. So these are common problems throughout Europe. But I, I really do think that quite a bit of change will come on the, not just on the political Islam side of things, as we say, but also on the hard security aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Alham, if you take the final word. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, <coughs> I see a certain recognition right now in uh, some European countries, France, for instance, Austria right now, and they are very much intending on addressing the issue of political Islam as a security threat. And now, um, um, it's very important that all of these measures, when they are done, they are done within the rule of law. Okay, it's, uh, for me, it's important that we do not lose sight from the importance of this, the values and norms that these, uh, that Europe um, uh, is standing on. And that is basically, we are free society, democratic, but at the same time, we are dealing with a very um, difficult task um, in terms of how do we address and combat uh, subversive, um, extremist ideologies that are using the very democratic norms and structures for their own benefit. Um, and that brings the culture dimension here. And, and uh, you know, security measures and Lorenzo was really right in that. Um, um, these persons were all known uh, to the security uh, uh, officials and um, you arrest one, a second one will come. Um, you get rid of 10, you will have 20 coming back. And the question for me is that as long as we do not deal with the fountain, the real source, um, we will not be able to address this threat because it is a threat on the long run. Look at the impact of um, uh, Islamist uh, separatism on the communities where they have a hold on um, segregation, reflects on social cohesion, and the kids and youth are very often, if you look at the surveys, are more radical, in fact, sometimes fundamentalist in their own views than their parents, than their grandparents. Um, without addressing the source, and that is the ideology, and the ideology is not coming like a, a, as a cloud, ideology are permitted, are um, uh, um, uh, spread through structures. And the structures are these societies, are certain mosques, are religious schools, are Quran schools. Without acknowledging that, we can use security measures from today until tomorrow or the end of time, in 20 years from now, if we do not address these issues, we will regret it. 
And Europe, the one with these beautiful values and norms, democratic free societies that we should defend will not be as we uh, expected. And here it would have been really, from my perspective, really nice if we had also uh, the input of uh, the other colleague who would have uh, been also able to speak about far right groups because they feed on each other. They like very much each other. They would like to pluralize our societies. We need to deal with both in order to preserve uh, this democratic settings we have in Europe. Elhamen, for, for both, I'm sorry. Since Linda uh, wasn't able to, to reach, uh, to join us, and since ER pays so much attention to the, the links and the similarities between different kinds of extremism, as Ilham was saying, do you uh, feel like adding something about it? Do you think that Austria is a case in point in the notorious um, cycle and imitation cycle that uh, experts have been studying lately um, between far right and jihadism or even far right and political Islam? Do you, uh, again, Lorenz or Ilham, feel like adding something about the far right and its links with other uh, radical landscape in Austria? Uh, I think uh, I would have loved to have a competent uh, uh, specialist because uh, I'm not really specialist. I see the similarities in certain patterns. Uh, both are very much focusing on uh, uh, issues of uh, superiority of their identity. Both of them are um, using also a victimhood kind of like um, uh, narratives. Uh, they're saying it's like our, our um, the, uh, the far right is basically saying us we are being invaded, we will be replaced, uh, you know? And, and the Muslim, uh, uh, the Islamist um, uh, ideology is telling uh, its supporters, we are under attack, we are victims, uh, we have to, uh, to, to, uh, to act. But I'm not a specialist uh, uh, on far right groups. Um, and uh, I don't know ab about Lorenzo, but it would, would, would have been really, <laughs> would have <Yeah>. been. <laughs> Same thing. I know it exists, of course, in Austria, but it's quite, quite a scene. Of both the, the violent and non violent, like we talk about violent and non violent Islamists, uh, we can talk about violent and non violent right wing extremists. Um, I know it's fairly well organized, uh, uh, some of it has been in the media. Uh, I, I'm not an expert, so beyond that, I, I don't like to speak about things I don't really know much about. Same here. <laughs> Hopefully, something to get into next time. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, thank you for being. Uh, we shall see you soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.